Well, since faith comes through hearing, and hearing through the Word of God, oh, it is always good when we get to open up God's Word and learn more from His Word uh, to uh, be helped and benefited and strengthened in the faith through His Word. It, the Word gives life. Uh, mysteriously, it gives life to the dead. It gives spiritual life to those who don't have it. And that those who have it, it gives spiritual life growth, sustenance, strength, maturity, building up, blessing. Anytime we get to hear the word is a good time, right? Anytime we get to hear the word is a good time. So let's go before the Lord in prayer before we look at his word again this evening. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for this opportunity to hear your word. You are great, as the song we sung reveals. You are holy, you are worthy. Uh, We can gather for 15, 20, 30, 50, 60, infinity amount, or we we would like to. uh, It would be a blessing to gather all those times on the Lord's Day, to hear more of your word. We need more of your word. We only have a finite amount of time. We only have so many years of gathering on Sundays to hear your word and years on this earth to learn and grow. And so we just take this as a really, really, really important another opportunity uh, to grow in your word, to put things together, Lord, uh, in our hearts from your word, uh, to be moved to act differently, think differently, live differently. And so would you help us now as we open your word, uh, give me the ability to to just communicate the word in such a way that would be helpful to those who are here and give us all the ability to be attentive to what you'd have for us tonight. We say this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the timing of Robert Murray McShane's reading this week, I just think couldn't have been any better uh, considering what we've been dealing with in our Matthew series, the parable this morning of the day laborers working in the master's house and his vineyard uh, from the end of Matthew 19 into chapter 20. Being our sermon text this morning, I was just struck with another parable that illustrates perfectly what we've been seeing the last few weeks in our series from the rich young ruler. If you remember, we saw him rich, he was religious, but he was ruined, to the humble being last here on earth, last in the experience now, to being first later uh, in the future, and then the proud being first here on earth, first for the here and now, in their own mind and in other people's thinking, worldly thinking, uh, only to be the last Uh, in the end, as we saw this morning. So a parable like this comes at a perfect time. And we come to another parable in the Gospel of Luke, a parable uh, that comes after, this is in Luke 16, which is after the famous prodigal son and lost coin parables. Um, But it's a parable that comes after Jesus' teaching on not being uh, able to serve God in money right, in Luke's gospel, and also Jesus just flat calling out the Pharisees for being lovers of money. I want you to see it right now, just this kind of burn moment that Jesus gives in Luke 16, verses 14 through 15, right before what we see in our parable. Listen to what Jesus says to the Pharisees. It says, uh, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You see that? He who would be exalted or first before men in this world will be last and judged. Do you see that? Even right here in Jesus' rebuke 
to these lovers of money, Pharisee, religious men. This is just a glimpse of more of what Jesus in his countercultural kingdom ministry was all about. We saw that this morning, how upside down and different and, you know, just surprising the nature of the kingdom really is. And this leads us to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And I'm going to read through the whole parable for us to get us the whole gist of it because, as we saw this morning, our interpretation of parables must really get at the main point and emphasis uh, of what Jesus was getting across instead of getting into the weeds too much. So reading the whole parable will be instructed for us as a whole. Like we read it this morning, we read another parable as a whole this morning. Then we're just going to glean a few short, quick principles uh, in the end to take home for us to apply to our lives. Sounds good? Big old long parable right now. Then a few principles, few words at the end and uh, in closing, and then we'll get to our time of congregational prayer as we pray for one another. So let's look at this parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Hear this, the word of God, Luke 16, 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores. See the contrast there? The rich and the poor. Verse 21, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being tormented, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame." But Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. And Lazarus, in like manner, manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here. And you are in anguish. Besides all this, between us and you, A great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able. A nun may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, talking to Abraham, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers so that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from The dead. That's the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Fitting in light of all that we've been seeing. Sobering point and implications that Jesus is making. It's actually been debated amongst good Christians over the years. If this is indeed a parable, and I think it is for certain features, but even if it wasn't, the point in principles remain. You know, like there really are people in, in places in the afterlife, right? So it's not like Jesus couldn't be passing on uh, some reality, but it seems like for various reasons that we don't need to get into here in this evening uh, sermon and service that this would be a parable. But, you know, even if it wasn't, even if this was true, and it could certainly, you know, be true in terms of these are real realities, 
um, um, then I think a lot of the same principles would remain. So regardless of where you might take this, whether it's a parable or whether uh, it's an account of, of things that, are, that, are, that have happened and that Jesus is, is passing on, I think some, the principles will remain. And this is an example, I hope you just see it as we read it and what we've seen before this morning and last week, um, of someone who would be considered the first in the world's estimation, the rich man. I mean, he, 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 had, he had so much. He, he was doing so well. Uh, he, on earth, feasted sumptuously every day. He wore clothing and a purple fine linen, and he was rich, and he had the best clothes. He had the best food. Uh, he was doing so well on, on earth. That much is, is clear. That much is, is so evident. But, so he was first on earth, but what, what do we find out in the end? He goes, to, he goes to a place of judgment, suffering. The first, last, right? We see that here, but also we see the last in the world's estimation, this poor man, Lazarus, who had sores, who didn't have food. He was at the king's table. He's looking for the scraps and dogs are licking him. This is in, in his earthly life, like this poor suffering of a man on earth. Being last in world's estimation. If you see somebody so bad off, so uh, poverty stricken, they're, they're begging. It's a beggar. It's somebody who doesn't, doesn't, isn't able to provide and it's just struggling and it's, it's terrible. He's got sores Sores, some kind of a some kind of a terrible disease. Oh, it's terrible for him. That's his earthly life. Like that's someone who's last in the world's eyes. Last, humble, lost, like just desperate. But in the end, we see the flip. Right? We see the he's first. Like he's doing well in the afterlife. The proud rich man even knew Lazarus when he was living but didn't seem to care much about this pus-ridden, desperate man under his table, D did he? On earth. He just let him suffer. He didn't pay him any regard. Unlike the good Samaritan who helped the bleeding out traveler who was attacked by robbers, this rich man knew the poor man Lazarus. He, he calls him by name in the afterlife. It's not like he didn't know him. He knew him. He, he, he knew Lazarus. But he paid him no attention when Lazarus was suffering and, and begging and, and needy. Now let me just be clear, being rich doesn't equal being an unbeliever. But ignoring the needy like that in pride, which this rich man in the parable did, that picture's unbelief, right? <laughs> he was worse than the even rich young ruler. The rich young ruler uh, w was, was a, a, an actual account of a young man coming to the disciples. That wasn't a parable, but if we just compare, uh, the rich young ruler was keeping uh, aspects of the law and put together, you know, at least, and, and, and you know, d didn't, there wasn't any features of his life that Jesus was pointing out that he was kind of using even his riches to extort people or do that bad things. Or, you know, the rich young ruler may have been a nice and even generous uh, type of guy, even though he loved his money, even though he dealt with covetousness, even though he wouldn't set it aside to follow Jesus. Uh, he liked his money more than Jesus. He chose money over Jesus. So the rich young ruler was lost, but this, this rich man in, the pa uh, in this parable uh, seems to be almost even worse, right? Like, so enslaved to his riches and on his way to judgment. How do I know that? Because we see him in the parable die. And then we see him in the parable in judgment. So there's no, there's no kind of uh, mystery here. Like with the rich young ruler, I mentioned, you know, should the rich young ruler repent later? I mean, he has this interaction. He's a young man with Jesus. You, you'd like to think that that was an impact on his life. The Bible doesn't give us anything more about the rich young man's life other than he went away sorrowful because he had many possessions. Uh, but I guess it, we could... 
there's a potential for that rich young man who at that moment decided not to follow Jesus and was sorrowful. Uh, maybe someday, maybe down the road, as Jesus' uh, continued fame and, and uh, uh, renown and all the things, and then he dies and the, 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 all the different aspects of his resurrection and his ascension and the future. I mean, there was a lot ahead that the rich young man may have heard about. There other, who knows? Maybe the rich, the rich young man we don't see in the account being in this situation, then dying and going to judgment. So there was some hope for him. But this rich man in the parable was selfish. The rich man in the parable was careless, didn't care about Lazarus. He dies, and, and he's in judgment. This is where he's at. The poor man, Lazarus, on the other side, was suffering, and he was hurt. We don't know or see any indication of his faith in the Lord in the parable, it doesn't indicate that just in the, the parable when he's alive, right? We don't see that. But since he ended up in this intermediary state in Abraham's side or bosom um, and not in Hades and suffering like the rich man, it's clear that this poor suffering man was in fact a b- believer, right? The evidence of the fact of where he went after his, his death points to the fact that he was a believer, right? And just as all not all the rich are unbelievers going to judgment because Abraham, Father Abraham himself, was a rich man, and yet he was not in in Hades, uh, of course, right? And so just as not all the rich are unbelievers, not all the poor are simply believers just by very nature being poor and suffering, uh, they still have to trust the Lord. They still have to go to Jesus. That Just being destitute and poor doesn't just make you saved, make you a believer. But this particular man, Lazarus, was clearly in this parable a believer because of we, where we see them go after their death. Make sense? So Lazarus was in a joyous place in the intermediary, eh, intermediate state. Uh, which is where a a soul would go uh, prior to the resurrection and the rich man uh, to the place of judgment in the intermediary state, which is uh, where an unbeliever's soul uh, would be at prior to the future resurrection of the just and the unjust. We recognize that, uh, you know, after our death, prior to the resurrection, um, there's, there's a time in between awaiting, right, the future bodily resurrection that both believers and unbelievers uh, will have and then have coming to them in the future. We all get that in terms of just a biblical uh, understanding of death and the afterlife? Do we we get that, right? We know that everyone will be. Some people think, oh, yeah, but believers will be resurrected like Jesus. But they don't ever really think about the fact that unbelievers are also resurrected. Except that they're just just going to a place of judgment, not to the new heaven, the new earth. That that we talked about this morning that believers have, have coming to them. Both the just and the unjust are awaiting something after death. Prior to the resurrection, that's what's going on here. And the rich man was in suffering as an unbeliever. The Lazarus joyous intermediate state uh, blessing is a believer. The rich man suffering as an unbeliever. And this uh, 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 poor guy, on the other hand, Lazarus, paradise as a believer. It's just a stark contrast uh, of, of the fate of those after death. The first shall be last, the, the last shall be first. You, you see that kind of even worked out uh, as an illustration here in this parable. And this sets the stage, as I've been sharing, as reading it and thinking about it a little bit, just for the setting of the parables and where we might be able to glean now quickly a few principles here at the end prior to our time of, of prayer. And so... What are some principles that that we can just take from this parable uh, for our lives now? I mean, we're here for a reason. Let's take some things home. Let's apply them to our lives. Let's think about things in light of what we just read in this parable. Implication number one. How we live on earth leads and impacts the next life, the afterlife. Doesn't it? I'm, we know that already, right? Like we think about that and, and other passages reveal that. But in this just nugget of a parable, we see it all kind of wrapped up together. Someone's earthly life, their death, their afterlife, all in this parable. 
we see two different outcomes. One to suffering, pain, anguish. Uh, one uh, doing pretty well in Lazarus. How we live on earth impacts the next life. And notice even in the parable now, like I said, we don't get in the weeds of the parable in the too, too much, like too, too. But, but the reality is like th- this idea that some people have in cartoon theology and doctrine uh, that, that people become uh, angels or something or things of that nature uh, clearly um, isn't the case. There's a distinction even in the parable between angels and a human and Lazarus and and, and we see, though, there's consciousness. There's, you know, there are some false uh, doctrines of death and the afterlife that teach soul sleep, uh, that people after their death will just have no consciousness until the future resurrection. And that's actually a, a, a heresy uh, that has been refuted by many throughout uh, church history. Um, but this idea of soul sleep isn't true either, because what do we see in this example? We see consciousness we see even we see in, even in our actions, and so. Uh, but how you live on this earth affects the next life. You see that in both of these, going to different different outcomes, right? If you trust the Lord, like the poor man with the sores and Lazarus, uh, you, you you will uh, you have something uh, better awaiting you. In in contrast to the suffering and difficulties of the world, you have that. And and if you don't. If you don't trust the Lord or if you uh, pursue riches and unbelief and things of that nature over following uh, the Lord and things of that nature, like the rich young ruler, if the rich young ruler uh, persisted all the way to his death, you're going to have an outcome like this rich man in this parable. See that? How we live in this life affects the next. Implication number two. Our future state after death will either be suffering or glorious comfort and joy. This relates to the last one and what we've already said, but you see uh, just what is being communicated. Uh, this rich man who had it all, who was first in this life, uh, who, who had the food and had the clothing and was doing really, really well, uh, goes from, from all of that and failing to trust the Lord and is in some, some severe suffering and torment in the afterlife. It's bad. But the poor man who had a terrible life on earth is the least of these because he trusted the Lord. Oh, it was so glorious in the next life. We, we know that how we live affects our future, but, but there really is this contrast of experiences in uh, the afterlife. And, and I don't know about you, but this is a very, 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 blip on the radar, momentary in the grand scheme of eternity, our life on earth. Been doing a lot of funerals lately and been thinking about the weight of that. Romans 8 says that our uh, present sufferings just pales in, in comparison to future glory. Just be reminded of that. Things may be difficult now and praise God and thank God that it's not so bad that we're begging with sores like this Poor man, Lazarus, but even if we were, if you knew that you had what Lazarus had awaiting him in glory, do you think that that might impact the way that you might suffer today? If we really knew that and took it to heart. This parable, though a parable, is revealing real truth. And I think that's an implication. Our future state after death will either be suffering or glorious comfort and joy. I choose the Lord. I choose comfort and joy. Would we all? Should we all? We should. Uh, Good tidings of comfort and joy. Let's think of Jesus. Let's think of the gospel. Let's let's prioritize that because ah, the suffering, the that that is just a terrible situation. Implication number three. We should have the same urgency in this life now as we might in the next one when we're actually experiencing that reality. What do I mean by that? The rich man didn't really care about seeking God in the first life, in in, in his life on earth. 
He was an unbeliever. He didn't prioritize that at all. He ignored that. He didn't pursue that. And he also, which by implication, didn't care about evangelizing his lost family members while he was alive on, on earth. And in this parable, in, in this parable of the afterlife, life, all of a sudden, he just like gets really eager to do good to, to, to those who are still alive, to his family uh, on earth. He, he doesn't want what's happening to him to happen to them. And I think this principle that, uh, you know, he had urgency at that moment, uh, we should have urgency because those things are really coming. Heaven and hell, uh, suffering uh, and joy. I mean, those things are really coming. These aren't made up things. These are real things. And so shouldn't that give us urgency in this life? So if this rich man had urgency in the afterlife, but as we're going to see, wasn't able to do anything about it. Don't you think that we, with wisdom, could we glean wisdom from this parable to have urgency in this life so that if we have family members and friends and neighbors who don't know Jesus, who have awaiting for them the suffering of this rich man, if we know people like that, shouldn't we have urgency now in this life like this rich man had urgency in the afterlife, but was able, was a, no, wasn't able to do really anything about it. I think we need to, to take as a principle from this parable even some urgency so that we might now, before it's too late, because it's too late, the this, this ship has sailed as we're going to see. Once we're gone, it's not that it was too late for his family members, Meaning they could still, but it was too late for, for him to do anything about it. And once you're gone, it's too late for you to do anything about it. When you're gone, now those who are left behind could still get saved and could still get evangelized, but it's not going to be by you. Why not take that urgency now in this life that we might learn in the next life that we learned about in this parable and apply it to our life now? Does that make sense? This leads us to our final implication and implication number four. Implication number four, the word of God is what leads to repentance and true salvation. Not on-demand miracles or, or anything of that nature. The word of God leads to salvation. The rich man was begging Lazarus. Oh, please, just help my family out. He was begging Abraham to go send Lazarus, right? Like, in this parable. But Abraham gives direction. This rich man had five brothers, and he wants um, to warn them because he cared for them, and he didn't want them to experience what he was experiencing in the afterlife, which was suffering. Punishment was not good. So he says in verse 28, for I have five brothers. Send them. Send them to my father's house. Father Abraham, please, send, send Lazarus for me. <laughs> the rich man didn't care about Lazarus during his life, during the life on earth, but now he's wanting Lazarus to go. Warn his brothers so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. You see what he's asking, what he's worried about. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. I'm telling you, that's what we need. That's what we need. We need a miracle. We need a resurrection. Uh, or we need Lazarus to be raised from the dead. Go, and they're going to know him. Oh, man, that's the guy with the sores. I mean, he was at, you know, you know my brother's house. Uh, he was at the door with the dogs. and he was, at the, he was at the table with the scraps. I mean, Look at he rose from the dead. But Abraham said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should raise them from the dead. The word of God is what leads to repentance and true salvation, not on demand uh, miracles. If somebody has the word of God, you know, he says Moses and the prophets, it's the word. Let them hear them. 
Because why? Faith comes by hearing, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, before our prayer. And, and hearing comes from the word of God. Uh, they need the word of God. That's what they not. They have the word of God, don't they? Well, yeah. Well, well the, the rich man thought that that wasn't sufficient. That wasn't good enough. That that couldn't save. That that couldn't convince. That that couldn't lead to repentance. That that couldn't warn them. No. The word of God could, though even though the rich man did not see the sufficiency of the scriptures to save and sanctify, to, 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 to transform and to rescue, the rich man didn't see it. The rich man thought, no, 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 we need something different. We, we need this, you know, raise him from the dead, like walking dead zombies coming. Around. He's just all Lazarus coming. And, 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 and he thought that that's what would do the trick. But you see, Abraham said that if they're going to be obstinate and deny the truth of God's word, which has the power to save and change, they're not going to be convinced even if someone's raised from the dead. See that? How important is the word of God? If I just thought of this now. We had an opportunity on the Lord's Day to do a demonstration every single Lord's Day of resurrection and someone giving some afterlife story. That would pale in comparison to the preaching of the word of God. God has intended the word of God, the truth of his word, to be even more powerful than some miracle of someone being raised from the dead and coming up to the pulpit. Could you imagine? That would be something. <laughs> oh, just raised. I was, I was in the afterlife, and it's terrible. Believe you me. Uh, repent for... Abraham says here that that's not going to work. That's not going to cut it. Cut it. The word of God is what's powerful. We need to uh, uh, be able to see that, sit under. That's why we get another chance to hear the word of God. Let's hear it. Let's enjoy it. Let's, let's be blessed by it. That's what leads us to growth and repentance and salvation. That's what we need to give to our lost family members and friends. Uh, uh, do you see how powerful the word of God really is? And to that end... I think that's a good place to, to just end with those four implications after seeing this, uh, to, to, to be eager to apply these things, to have the kind of urgency in the Christian life, uh, not to be uh, lazy and careless about things, but to care about the eternal uh, souls of the people that are here with us here on this earth, and to be able to give them the word of God that is powerful to, to transform lives and impact now in this earth what will happen for eternity, feel the urgency of it from this parable and apply it, apply it all to our lives. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for what, what you've revealed to us here in this parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Help us not to let these things fall on deaf ears. Help these truths to impact the way we live now. Help it to encourage believers about what they have coming to them, even if life is hard, even if they're suffering. Help it to also encourage believers to have an urgency about what uh, we're called to now on this earth and how urgent uh, it is, but also help us to see the power of the word, the word preached, the word read, the word displayed, that it's the word that leads to repentance, that it's the word that saves lives, that it's the word that uh, impacts eternal destinies now. Let's submit our hearts to that, and let's pray now. Oh, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you'd help us to pray now in light of these things. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen.